Assalamu alaikum and welcome to our channel Baytul Gadeen. This is our first interactive channel of its kind. Um, today we have our brother Hassan Bahari who's joined us today. Um, Hassan Bahari, you can give us background of our channel and our purpose, inshallah. Thank you, Sayyid Ali, um, for introducing me. And uh, well, Bayt al Ghadir has been set up to counter uh, what has become an increased amount of propaganda against the Shia Muslim community, particularly those in the West which are facing a great deal of oppression uh, through general hatred, whether it be through different forms of social media. And we're even witnessing some of our own communities actually being physically attacked and verbally assaulted in universities. So essentially we were thinking at the time, and hence the creation of this channel, to provide a platform wherein we can actually gather and, pro and stand up for ourselves so people understand that if we are Shia Muslims, we are for a reason. And um, we are here to, be stand to stand up and be counted. That's the purpose of Battle of Adir. And uh, inshallah this will be, this is one of our very early shows. Um, for this show, we are going to be discussing the life of Abdullah ibn Umar. And um, the reason we are doing so is he played a pivotal role in shaping what is, in this day and age, the Sunni doctrine of Khilafat. So we felt that it was important for viewers to understand who Ibn Umar was, his life, his thinking, his ideology, and his influence on Sunni Muslims today. So, um, I mean, what do we know about uh, Abdullah ibn Umar in terms of his um, his role as a companion? Um, I understand he belonged to uh, the, the second generation of Sahaba. Um, obviously, you had the, the earlier Sahaba who would have included uh, the likes of you know, Abu Bakr and Umar. Um, but, you know, Ibn Umar himself, he belonged to the, the later Tabqa of uh, Sahaba, to the later generation, Correct. the yeah. younger generation. Yeah. So, I mean, what was his role during the life of the Prophet. I know we have many traditions that talk about his virtue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of his life, as you said, so that he is from uh, the later, sort of in terms of age, generation of the Sahaba. So, for example, there are, you have the older Sahaba, such as Amir al Mu'minin, Lay Salam, Abu Bakr al Usman, who had regarded as the, those which he did the call of Nabi Bar Sallallahu early on, this has been from al Sunnah texts, and they are regarded as the elder statesmen in terms of the Sahaba. In comparison, this is in comparison, I forget a bit of a he was young in age, but in comparison, when we look at other Sahaba, such as Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, they are counted amongst the, basically the youngsters, those which essentially came to Islam Fathers were already Muslim, and they basically acquired knowledge of the deen very early on from their fathers through the Prophet Abdullah ibn Umar is one such individual. Um, it seems textbooks suggest that he would have been around about 12, 13 years of age at the time the Battle of Badr took place and all the yeah. later battles. And so, uh, he, if we look at it from Al Sunnah's perspective, it's an individual that acquired a great deal of knowledge from of the seer of the Prophet, Hadith of Prophet. Um, Even virtue. In virtue. Uh, yeah. I mean, I understand that there were some times where he wanted to participate in battle at a very young age and he was refused Correct. Uh, by the Prophet in peace and blessings of being part of his family. The Prophet uh, gave him permission to fight. But it's an interesting point as well because, mm. you know, 15, it seems pretty young age to uh, to go fight a battle, mm -hmm. but nowadays 15 year olds are treated like children. It's true. Um, that's, a, that's a good point, actually. I know it's a side issue, but it's a very good observation. I and mean, children, are, the way that 15 year olds are viewed today, are not the way 15 year olds were viewed at that age. They were deemed mm. capable of partaking in um, campaigns and war campaigns. They had the necessary skills in the opinion of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his blessed family, to partake in that. So, so that's it's important. Yeah, I mean, with Ibn Umar himself, I mean, obviously there's a lot that we could uh, discuss in terms of the actual, um, his contribution during the lifetime of the Prophet. Mm -hmm. um, well, so, so then I think it's important to also mention uh, an, another point. One, he's perhaps the, arguably, one of the 
the most prolific Hadith narrators in the text of Rasulullah Jinnah. This is a very important point. Second point is, um, he was the blood brother um, um, of Hafsa um, 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 So he was an individual that benefited from entering the harem of a wife of the Prophet. And it is argued on that basis he would have acquired a greater understanding knowledge of the seer of the Prophet, which is a fair point. I don't think it's a point that, you know, I can understand if that's a, an argument that's advanced. So I thought it's important to have that background. He's a prolific Hadith narrator, and how this prolific Hadith narrator influenced um, history through his thinking is where we, inshallah, go next. Now, I think for another show we'll probably discuss um, Sakifa Banisad. Yeah. It's probably not very clear yeah, because what we're really talking about Ibn Umar. What we know is Ibn Umar was a grown man when the event of Sakiko Banisada took place, and there are certain narrations from him on how important it was to give the bayah uh, to Abu Bakr. So he was present during that period, understandably so. Um, when his father uh, was Khalifa, obviously he was present, and, and without any doubt, gave bayah. What we have is we have a very interesting uh, point in history. At the, uh, at the point that uh, the second caliph has been stuck, he decides to set up a six man shura. Six individuals. So it's important to mention here as well that the fact that how Abu Bakr himself was appointed, yes. and then how later, you know, he was, Abu Bakr was. You know, allegedly appointed by consensus of the Sahaba, mm -hmm. um, and when Abu Bakr was about to pass away, you know, there's a famous hadith which says that when he was asked, Abu to, Abu, no, Abu Bakr, okay. you know, are you going to appoint anybody um, after you? Oh yes, yeah. And uh, where he stated himself that you know, had the Messenger of Allah so of sudden, appointed somebody, correct, um, I too would have appointed someone. Yeah. But then, interestingly, what happened? He did appoint someone. He did appoint someone. Who did he appoint? Uh, he, he appointed him. He appointed him. And then what happens afterwards when Abu Bakr passed away? You know, yeah. we have the, the Khalifa of uh, Umar. Yeah, for a 10 year period, I think it is a 10 Roughly, year. yeah. So essentially, so once he's been stabbed, and as a result, which he, um, he, he passes away, during that period in which he's injured, he establishes a six man shura. So he takes an opinion that these six individuals are those upon whom something as important as leadership of the Ummah will rest on their shoulders. So these six individuals will make that call decision. But it's interesting that um, Abdullah ibn Umar is also present and has a very important role there. In fact, um, it's quite funny, originally, I, 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 when I was looking into this topic, I assumed he was there just as a, a caretaker to oversee the proceedings. Um, and there's an interesting narration actually here in Tarikh uh, Tabi, this is the English uh, translation, um, volume number 15, page number 144. It did make me laugh actually when I read it, it made me think as well about some point that um, Ibn Umar, uh, Abdullah Ibn Umar, when it came, with regards to him, people actually approached Umar and said, well, why don't you appoint your son as a Khalifa? And his response says, how can I appoint a caliph, someone who has been unable to divorce his wife? So I'm just simply saying that he was, in his own opinion, mm. Abdullah Ibn Umar was not, not particularly competent. Mm. Uh, you know, other people say, oh, it's just a dad mocking his son. It's quite a, a, a dressing down, and it's a public dressing down, saying he's not really that competent to lead the Umar. Mm. And, um, but he was, he but, was competent enough to... Yeah, but, but he'll, you'll see the next point. This is a very important point. But another funny thing is he's also, because obviously, you know, no disrespect, but he is regarded as a mujtahid. But you can see how a father doesn't really yeah, he was a jurist, as a particular I mean, he was, a, he was a narrator of hadith, you know. Precisely. His father didn't have that much confidence with him on this issue. Um, now, coming back to the issue of the Sukhs and Al-Shura, I, I think I'll read uh, some more text from uh, Dubri, page 146. Reason being, you'll see a very important role that Abdullah Umar had here. 
Um, so I will just quickly read it. So basically, the six man show has been set up, and this is uh, these are the words of the word here. Uh, led into deliberations, Ali, Usman, Zubair, Saad, Saad bin Abu Qas, Abdul Rahman bin Auf, and Tala, if he arrives. Have, have Abdullah bin Umar present, but she, he shall have nothing to do with the matter of the appointment. Stay with them, and if five agree to approve one man, but one refuses, smash his head in or strike it off with a sword. If four agree to approve of one man, but two refuse, cut off the latter's heads. If three approve of one of them and three approve of another, get Abdullah bin Umar to make a decision. Let whichever party in favour which he makes his judgment select one of themselves. If they do not accept, Abdullah bin Umar's judgment will be on the same side as Abdullah bin Umar. Kill the rest if they do not go <laughs> along with the general consensus. But what sorry, I find, what, I'm sorry, what, page, what page number is that? What volume Pages 146 to 147. Uh, this is uh, Tabri volume number 15. Yeah, just for the, the viewers' sake, any references which we will quote today, you're more than welcome to contact the channel. Um, uh, otherwise, inshallah, we will try to get somebody to put them into... Volume 14, apologies. Volume 14, okay. We'll try to get them to um, put into the comment section of, of the video. So all the references are available there. Um, and by all means, you can go out there and you can, you can look at them. Look at them for yourself because, you know, you don't have to trust what we've got to say. You yeah. might think our opinions are biased. Yeah. But I think it's an important point here because on the one hand, father says son's not competent enough to lead the Ummah as a caliph, but he has got a right of appointment, and it's very interesting about that right of appointment. He's essentially the kingmaker. You know, like you have in this day and age, you know, when you have a kind of a political dispute, and someone's got the ability to decide who has that role. The same son who's not competent enough to lead has is competent enough to be the kingmaker. And look at how much violence is connected to this. If there's any opposing opinions, people should be put to death. And one does wonder where is this concept uh, formulated from. You know, you get this day in Asia, people who oppose the caliph immediately, you know, you've heard kind of horror stories from ISIS, sort of uh, the narrative in Iraq where any opposition people are slaughtered. And when you look at these sort of narrations where there's a threat of violence, where six competent, what you'd say, the lead men of the Sahaba, are having discussions, even if there's a dispute, they um, they are under the sort of threat of death. So Osman's come into power. He's he's, he's essentially now become the Khalifa. Absolutely. He's had his rule. Um, again, Osman is a separate topic. We can talk about his life and how he died and who was responsible for it. Yeah. So now, once the power had shifted from Osman, yeah. I mean, what are the circumstances from Imam Malik Islam's uh, Khalifa? We know that okay. at first he refused. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. Essentially, he refused it to begin with, mm -hmm. and it wasn't until they practically begged him to, uh, correct, correct. to take that role. No, well, yeah, people, I mean, you can see narrations from the Shia narrative in Nadu Balala, I mean, when he says, I've got nobody interested in it, like this things of a goat. Uh, he goes, it's not important to me. He wanted to see, and then when people pressured him, he said, I'll tell you what, I will come out and you, there'll be a public bayer. Let's see if you, you know, recognise, you know, you back up your words. That's why if you see, a lot of people do say that, um, it was perhaps the most open type of bayah was that to be in Romania where people came forward and made their bayah because they were in a desperate situation and they deemed him as the individual most competent to do so. So that, the circumstances, obviously, by the time when Osman had been killed, there was political upheaval, there was a vacuum, and the people of Medina approached to be in Romania and said, we want to recognize you as caliph. So generally speaking, the Sahaba yeah. had accepted the Pledge of Allegiance Absolutely. with uh, Imam Ali Islam. But what's interesting is, mm. if we go to this book, it's called uh, the, the Lives of the Noble Khalifas. Um, and this book is available, you can buy it from the bookshop. It says on page number... Why Ibn it's, yeah, it's, 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 of... it's a part translation of Ibn Kathir's works, uh, Badaya wa Nahaya, which is... Um, uh, we don't even need to discuss how yeah, important yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. As it's, a, it's a very famous works. Um, but yeah, I mean, in page number 327, uh, amongst the people who refused to pledge allegiance to um, Imam Ali is it's reported that the people of Medina offered their pledge, but seven people deferred their submission and did not pledge. They included Ibn Umar. So Ibn Umar accepts the pledge of allegiance of Abu Bakr, even though we know from history there was a great bit of turmoil um, with the fact that different, you know, different uh, tribes 
try to come forward yeah. and essentially try to gain power. Mm -hmm. So even during that time of fitna, essentially with the time of fitna, um, he pledges allegiance to uh, Abu Bakr. He pledges allegiance to his father yeah. Umar. Yeah. He's appointed as the leader of the six-man shura, which essentially means that he would have pledged allegiance to Usman. But when it comes to the, the Khilafat of Imam Ali Islam, he refuses to give bayah. That's a very important point. In fact, so that I, um, I think it's probably relevant here to you kind of understand the, an individual's thinking when it comes to Mu'min you know, and uh, Ibn Umar. So what book is that? This is from Sayyid Bukhari actually, and it's uh, volume five, <coughs> Hadith number forty-seven. So this is the chapter dealing with the merits of uh, Usman, narrated Ibn Umar during the lifetime of the Prophet. During the lifetime of the Prophet, we considered Abu Bakr as peerless, and then Umar, and then Usman, coming next to him in superiority. And then we used not to differentiate between the companions of the Prophet. So I know there's this doctrine of the rightly guided caliphs. Um, that clearly was developed much later on, because in the opinion of Ibn Umar, one, two, and three in that order were the superior individuals, and, and everyone else was on an equal pedestal. So, okay, so. Okay, so the, when, you, when we look at the concept of bayah, that's kind of, you do kind of an under, understand if anyone was thinking, because he didn't team Imam Ali at that sort of rank of one, two, and three. So if he had a reason not to give bayah, it's probably that. I mean, isn't it ironic? Um, none of these points were actually brought up in Sakif Abu Musaida. One of the issues that do, does come out historically, it cannot be doubted that there was a dispute between the state yeah. and the Ali, the family of Emir and Mumani, Abu Bay, whatever. Very harsh. Yeah? There wouldn't even need to be a row if that at least be, well, an opinion being quoted. They would have said, why are you? Ali, why are you getting angry about this? You know that we only regard one, two, and three is important to the life of the Prophet. You're just an ordinary a normal, normal person. Exactly. So, what are you arguing about? But actually, it's interesting because even Abu Bakr himself in Sakifa said, um, you know, I'm just like you. Well, actually, the, the most, it's in Bukhari, isn't it? It's very well, uh, you know. I always say something to people that you can understand an individual's um, thinking through their first inaugural address. Whenever a president comes to power in America, that first address essentially sets the scene of who he is and how he's going to rule. And Abu Bakr himself says, and I know there's always arguments about superiority, X, Y, Z. He actually says, he goes, I've been put in charge of you, even though I'm not the best amongst you. So he's even he's acknowledging he isn't. So, I mean... And he's Sadiq as well, so yeah, he's too funny. exactly. So we so can't, we can't he, really go no, against that viewpoint. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's funny, he says that. No one has actually, no one actually bothered to stand up at Sakif and say, hang on a minute. What are you talking about? We, we know that you're the most superior. Ibn Umar would have probably been present, why didn't he? So, you understand, you, you do wonder where this sort of ideology was formulated. So, okay. But you can see how important Ibn Umar's thinking is, because uh, the most important Hadith narrator, compiler, decided to put that narration, is not Hadith, is it? It's an opinion. And he's placed that in the chapter on the merits of Osman. So the general consensus, well, you could say, Pretty much the general consensus at the time of the people was that Imam al Islam was the successor. Yeah. I mean, he was uh, um, uh, elected to be uh, the leader for the people of the time. Yeah. But Abdullah ibn Umar took a step back. Yes. What was the reason? I mean, some <laughs> people argue that it was it was to do with the fitna at the time. This is this is a thing that is very very important. We need to understand a very important point. Um, one of the points I think I'll actually mention that this will give you an understanding of. Kind of how important giving bayah is, okay? And then we'll understand, we need to question what was Ibn Umar doing here? Because you know what, the usual excuse is, oh, well, there's a lot of fitna going on. A lot of people defend Ibn Umar's actions and say, oh, there was fitna going on, there was uprising which led to Jamal, there was an uprising thereafter that was the Battle of Safin, and then there was an uprising of Nanwan. So Ibn Umar was, didn't want to do it because of these uprisings. But don't forget, Jamal didn't happen the next day. I mean, did, Mumni didn't become Khalifa, and one day later, Jamal just explodes. There was planning, and it took some months. So there's a period where there is a relative peace, even if there's upheaval in terms of discussion. Okay, let's assume there is. I don't know. We, we're not there. But to, there is a period when the people, the Mahajirin and the Ansar, have given bayah to me on I don't think that's disputed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I just remembered a, an account where apparently they say when this uh, you know, trial and tribulations were taking place. Mm. You know, some Sahaba actually physically broke the sword, yeah. and they, you know, they wanted to totally, you know, distance themselves from yeah. the 
the, the majority group at the time, which again, you know, we've come to the tradition which talk about separating from the majority group and what their punishment should be. Yeah. But, you know, we see Ibn Umar stepping back and avoiding, you know, um, you know, the... the Absolutely. But the, the, the points is on, on the issue of Bayah. You said you were going to mention something on yeah. the issue of Bayah. Yeah, on one hand, they said that he was delaying Bayah. Okay. Yeah. Just, just, just consider uh, th this text, which is from the Khilafah, is but that is... Uh, HT, it's very famous. HT, very famous, and then, you know, it's written by the, the early scholar. Uh, you know, their writings are very much influenced around, uh, along the a movement. What, what's the book called, sorry? The Khilafah, it's like their key, you know, like their key. The Khilafah. Okay, so, um, Al Khilafah, sorry. Al Khilafah, it'd probably be available the online, yeah, I think you'd probably find yeah, it. Yeah, you'll document. find it online, but the important point is what he said. What's Page written? number, sorry. Three to four. Okay. The Ijma of the Sahaba to establish a Khalifa manifested itself emphatically when they delayed the burial of the Prophet after his death whilst engaged in appointing a successor. Despite the fact that the burial of the dead is fine, and that it is haram upon those who are supposed to prepare for his burial to engage themselves in anything else until they complete the burial. The Sahaba were obliged to engage themselves in preparing the burial of the Prophet. Instead, some of them engaged themselves in appointing a Khalifa, rather than carrying out the burial. And some others kept silent on this engagement and participated in delaying the burial for two nights Despite their ability to deny the, uh, uh, to be, despite their ability to bury the prophet, so this was an ijma to engage themselves in appointing a khalifa rather than bury the dead. This could not be legitimate unless the appointment of a khalifa is more obligatory than the burial of the dead. It's a very important point here. It's so important having a khalifa and giving bayat to him, that uh, you can delay the burial of the seal of all messengers. The most Exalted creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet Muhammad, these people, and uh, messages. Uh, well, even though they do family. try to argue that later on that they did come and they did. Yeah, no, no, I, I, even that's a side issue. Yeah. I think the important thing is how important that bayah is. And I, you know what? This kind of links back to the, there's a the very famous duration. Uh, I think, in fact, I think even more mentions it, we'll probably discuss it in the later episode that he who doesn't give bayah to his khalifa. I mean, of time will we'll, yeah. we'll die in the death, death of Jaya. Yeah. So it, it seems quite relevant that it could have been during that period they didn't want to appear if someone dies when there's a gap. It had to be continued, you know, a continuation. They didn't want a situation where the state is left leaderless, no one gives bay and someone dies. That's how important it was. Sorry, so coming back to what you mentioned earlier about yeah. the tradition from Bukhari, which, which shows that, you know, Ibn Umar himself, yeah. you know, didn't really believe in the superiority of Imam Ali al Islam with yeah. the Sahaba as in, you know, he, there was a concept uh, during the time of the Prophet apparently where, you know, Abu Bakr was the most righteous and Umar was the smart. In that order. And then when it comes to Ali, well, there's no mention of him. But it's interesting, Ibn Hajar Asqalani, the famous scholar who wrote yeah. a very famous commentary of Sayyid Bukhari, uh, in his shad, in his commentary of that particular narration, he says, Ibn Umar didn't mention the Khalifa of Ali because he did not pledge allegiance to Ali due to the opposition on his caliphate. This is famous in authentic narrations. Ibn Umar opined not only to pay allegiance to someone about whom there is not a consensus of people, and that's why he did not pay allegiance to Ibn Zubair and Abdul Malik because of their opposition. But he paid allegiance to Yazid Ibn Mawiyah and then Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan after after Ibn Zubair's death. So as we can see, Ibn Hajj Asqalani says it's very authentically recorded that Ibn Umar refused to pledge his allegiance to Imam al Islam because there was no clear consensus or there was no clear agreement on it. Uh, and later he accepted the pledge of allegiance to Yazid and Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan. Right. So you can see how different the treatment of the Amin and Muhammad is, yeah? And what's the argument? Just mention that the crux of the argument is because there's no... There's no agreement. There's no agreement. Or you could say there was fitna take place, I mean... But the, the funny thing is, they, that's exactly what we're saying, there would have been agreement immediately, wouldn't there? Yeah, of course. People have given their bail, so why was he waiting then? What was making him delay then? You know, Osman's been killed, people have given bail, 
So there was an agreement. The Muhajir and Ansar had given back to Amir al Of course. And um, in fact, Shah Abdul Aziz Dili, in his very famous anti Shia work, Bufaist al Ashari, says that the real Shia of Ali were basically mentions were those Sahaba, I, uh, the Mahajirin and the Ansar who gave their bayah to Amir al So the bayah had already been given. So what on earth was Ibn Umar doing delaying things? So, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because if we look at, uh, for example, uh, the life of Imam al Islam mm. and his um, Ibn Ibn Umar's role during the time of Imam al Islam, mm. there seems to be you could say there's, there's definitely some sort of dispute going on. You could see how he kind of distanced himself to the Khalifa of his time, mm. and we know he he's not given his his pledge of allegiance at this point. But interestingly, there's a narration mm. which is mentioned in the books of history, oh, yeah. and these traditions are a very uh, these authentic uh, traditions. Again, by all means, as I said, we will try to put the the, the references in the, the, the comments of these videos. If not, you're more than welcome to contact the channel and we can always email you our references with the scans. Um, and by all means, you can go out to the bookshops and uh, you can buy the books yourself just to see, you know, it's not something we fabricated. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, al Dhabi, the famous scholar of Rajal, um, in his book, famous uh, Rajal book, Sierra uh, Lalam Nubala, says, Ibn Mubarak told us from Abdullah ibn Nafi, from his father, from Ibn Umar, that he said when Uthman was killed, he was met by Ali. So he said, O oh, Abdul Rahman, you are a man who is obeyed by the people of Sham. Hmm. And we know the people of Sham were essentially under the rule of Mawiyah. Again, Mawiyah, this is a whole different topic. You know, we, we need to do yeah. Definitely show the Mawi and who he was. So, you know, Imam Ali Islam saying, Oh Abdul Rahman, you are a man who's obeyed by the people of Sham. So the people of Sham were known to be Nawasib and mm -hmm. they had a lot of hatred towards Imam Ali Islam. Mm -hmm. Why would the people of Sham have you know essentially mm -hmm. be obeyed under Ibn Umar? There this must have been some sort of relationship. Absolutely, there. and there was. So Imam Ali Islam he said, Okay, oh, oh Abdul Rahman, you are a man who's obeyed by the people of Sham. I see fitna boiling. So go as I've made you an emir over them. So he said, by Allah, I remind you of your closeness to the messenger of Allah and my, and my companionship to him. Would you excuse me of this? But he refused. So he asked Hafsa with her to intercede on his behalf, but he still refused. Then he went to Mecca and he sent after him. They dashed to their camels quickly and he thought that he sought Al-Sham but was told that he went to Mecca so he calmed down. So as we can see from this uh, particular account, mm -hmm. you know, Imam Al-Islam made these efforts yeah. to appoint Ibn Umar as an Amir, mm -hmm. okay, over the people of Sham yeah. to <laughs> try to crush this um, fitna that was taking place Absolutely. and Ibn Umar basically he fled. He, 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 yeah, he, 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 he backs out. He doesn't want nothing to do with it. I think it's an important thing that we need to understand. Because people will often say, oh well, this shows how cordial and how much Imam Ali Islam trusted in the normal. What's the important thing here is, if there is a dispute, say for example me and you have a dispute, okay? It's common sense that to try and resolve that dispute, you know people, I know people. There might be a middleman that I know really like. But I know if I put, speak to that middleman, he might try and knock our heads together. Not, not literally, but so people understand. He's got some sort of sway. He's got some sort of influence to try and resolve the dispute. So it, rather than it get uglier and uglier, it can be knocked on the head. Okay, so we need to understand. Ibn Umar, his father, Abu Bakr, I mean, Abu Bakr and then Umar, during those caliphates, Mavia was uh, the governor of Syria. And they had a historical link with Syria. So he was made the governor, his brother was, and after that, Mavia was. And Umar kept him as that. And Umar had an immense respect for Mavia, he used to call him the king of the Arabs. So, there was that link between Umar and Mavia, and obviously, what I mean, the woman was trying to do is, look, you go there, use your influence. After all, your father is the one who appointed well, Mavia. Appointed him. He, As governor say, of Shah. Exactly. So um, it would make sense you send somebody who's exactly. you know, either related or close. Absolutely. And, and, and you know what? Think about this. You know how important it is. You know, if this fit them between two Muslims, the important thing is, right, is to try and quell them. Not to make things worse. 
To be honest, if you think about it, you know, let, let's, let's take this scenario. We do have a row, and we've got friends who know each other, and if they start swearing at each other, they go meet each other at the train station, whatever they do, they get uglier and uglier and uglier. Surely, any decent individual will try and quell that if you've got influence. Mm. If I go to someone and say, listen, deal with this one, please, can you try and... Can you try to at least resolve the problem? So, and surely, we're, talking, we're not talking about a dispute between so, me... So, and we're not talking about a dispute between me and you over a football team. Mm. We're talking about something about religion here. Yeah. Okay? The, the, you know, so instead of resolving that fitna, which once, ultimately, he refused to give Bayer on the grounds yeah. that, you know, there was fitna taking place, he was allowing the fitna to avoid it yeah, exactly. by not resolving the problem. By not resolving, because I want nothing to do with it. So this narration is taken from... And don't forget, there's another yeah. example. I mean, at Hudaybiyah, why did uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, send him smart? He sent us more because he was in Mayat, because he could go there and resolve, resolve the, problem. the problem. That was the uh, reason Amir al Mumin did, and look what he does. He goes, oh, I'm not interested. He just goes into hiding. Yeah, I mean, this, this account is it, it, mentioned in Sierra Al Alam, Nobla, in volume 3, page 224, but it's mentioned throughout the books of history. I mean, for example, again, um, the lives of the noble Khalifas. It, it's in page number 332, it says, When Ali decided to set out for Sham, because there was a lot of history behind why Imam al-Islam wanted to go to Sham because um, I, I believe his uh, original motive was to first go to um, Iraq Correct um, and then later he diverted that uh, to crush out the, the, the Nasr, the, the Nawasid uh, who were you know, uh, camp campaigning against Imam al-Islam in Sham It says, when Ali decided to sell for Sham, many people in Medina declined, uh, declined to join him He called Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab and urged him to join them but he said, I am a man of Medina. If they set out, I should come obediently. But I shall not go to fight this year. Then he set out for Mecca. So again, this is elaborating further onto that particular narration from Shir al Alam Nublaf um, by Dhabi, where it says that, you know, ultimately he abandoned the situation at the time and then he fled to Medina. Well, I think it's amazing when he says, I'm a man of Medina, and the people of Medina have given back to Medina and Romani. If you look at the history, the opposition that Amir al-Mumnin al salam faced were from the people of Syria. Let's say from the Syrian situation, the context here. They weren't people of Medina. The people of Medina were backing Amir al-Mumnin. So why wasn't he, like, as a man of Medina, then standing with them? It, it does really make you think about this whole concept about, you know, the, the four rightly guided caliphs or the concept of Khulafa Rashidin, you know. If there was a concept of Khulafa Rashidin, why all this dispute, you know? Yeah. Why, why, why are people like Ibn Umar who... Why are Russia a support of Rani Ghani mm -hmm. But anyway, I think we'll conclude it for today's episode. And inshallah, you will be joining us soon again uh, where we will be discussing the traditions related around the concept of uh, giving a bayah to a leader and uh, the various um, punishments surrounding those who refuse to, to give it. Uh, thank you for me and Brother Hassan Bahari as well. As